showdown. The Bible tells us of one titanic final confrontation when true and false worship collide, still to come just before Jesus returns. Here's what the Bible says. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And verse 8. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And it continues. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10. A warning against receiving the mark the beast. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This passage warns against receiving the mark of the beast. No one has the mark of the beast today, not yet. It is still in the future. We study it now to prepare for what lies ahead. All right, what is the mark of the beast? Is it something like this? Will those who receive the mark get stamped or branded with something on their forehead or on their hand? Let's take a look at the biblical word mark, what it means in Scripture. In the New Testament, Revelation 14, verse 9, it is the Greek word karagma, which means mark or seal of authority. It also means badge of servitude or ownership. In other words, those who receive the mark serve are owned by the beast power. In the Old Testament, the word is the Hebrew oath, which means sign or token or seal of authority. It also means beacon or monument. Okay, now, as for this mark of the beast, how will it be applied, and how will you recognize it? Is it a literal mark? Are we going to see someone going around with a stamp, stamping something on your hand, putting some sort of a chip inside your skin? Or is it a symbolic mark? Well, the book of Revelation, first of all, is a symbolic book. It's a prophetic book of symbols. The beast we're talking about is a symbolic beast. It's not a literal beast with seven heads and ten horns walking around. The image is a symbolic image. The name is a symbolic name. The number is a symbolic number. The seal is a symbolic seal. Logically, then, the mark of the beast is symbolic. And the devil's not stupid. He's not going to arrange it so those who receive the mark are walking around with a big stamp or brand mark on them so we can see them. 
I think he's smarter than that. In fact, I can say that with confidence because the Bible says that this will deceive almost the entire world. Now, how about the forehead or the hand? Because it says that those who receive the mark will get it in the forehead or in the hand. Well, what is that all about? If the mark is symbolic, that certainly sounds pretty definite, the forehead or the hand. But think about it for a second. The forehead is where moral decisions are made. In other words, if you think about something, you buy into it, you believe in it, you're settled in it, in your mind. A person makes a conscious decision to believe and follow something. That decision is made, so to speak, in the forehead, the frontal area of the mind. But the hand is a symbol of action. Yeah, I've got to do something. The Bible talks about doing things with your hands, completing something, action. Those who receive the mark in their right hand do not believe in the mark. They haven't bought into it in their minds, but they accept it to survive. Survive? What's that all about? Survive? How serious is this? Here's what the Bible says, Revelation chapter 13. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be, what does it say? Killed! Oh my! This is pretty serious. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, verses 15 through 17. What does that tell us? Can't buy or sell? You mean I can't go to the store and buy stuff? I can't sell stuff? I can't get gas? I can't pay my house payment? I'll have nothing. That's exactly what it's talking about, my friend. Unless you are willing to receive the mark, you will be unable to buy groceries, get gas for your car, keep your insurance up, pay your house payment. You will have nothing. That's pretty powerful. Oh, wow. And a death decree. That's really something. That's incredible. If you don't receive the mark of the beast, you're going to be sentenced to death. The Bible tells us that. Woo, friend, are you ready for that? The mark of the beast is a deadly, serious issue, my friend. We need to know what it is and prepare to take a stand in that day. Amen. What is it all about? The central issue is worship. Worship, that's what it's all about. Revelation presents two groups. One group worships the Creator, described in Revelation 14, verse 7. One group worships the beast, described in verse 9. So here's how it breaks down. Revelation 14, verses 6, and 7, and 12 describe those who worship God and keep His commandment. Revelation 14 verses 8 to 11 describe those who worship the beast. Now, God is described in verse 7 as the creator. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Babylon is described in verse 8 in opposition to worshiping God as creator. Verses 9 to 11 talk about the mark of the beast's authority. Now, the passage does not talk about the mark of God's authority, but is certainly implied, and if there's a mark of the beast's authority, 
then we would expect to find a mark of God's authority, implied, as we shall see, in verse 12. What's the mark of God's authority, then? Well, this is the very important question. If we understand the mark of God's authority, that will help us understand the mark of the beast's authority. It pertains to his creatorship. Now, why do we say that? Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, right there in verse 7. How do we worship God as creator according to the Bible? Go back to the, to the creation of this world. Genesis 2, verse 3. And God blessed the, what does it say? Seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. How do we worship God as creator? Well, it's right there in the Ten Commandments, in the Big Ten. Remember the Sabbath day to do what? Keep it holy. Remember what day? The Sabbath day. To do what on that day? To keep it holy. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now compare Revelation 14, verse 7, the verse we've just been looking at. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Well, that's a very clear parallel, isn't it? So we worship God as creator by doing what? by keeping his Sabbath. Oh, my friend, are you keeping God's Sabbath? Amen? The Sabbath is a memorial of creation. Every seventh day is a memorial, a reminder that God is our creator. And the Bible, the book of Revelation, calls upon us to worship God as our creator. By the way, which day is the seventh day? Saturday is the seventh day. The word Sabbath itself means the sign or seal of the Father. Sabbath, broken down in Hebrew, Ab is the Father, B is the dwelling place, the Hebrew letter there, Ath or Oath is the the sign. So in other words, the sign or seal of the Father. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So Sabbath's very important. The sign or seal of the Father. It also pertains to his law. Verse 12 in Revelation 14. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So to worship God, on the one hand, means to keep his commandments. Well, that's the Ten Commandments, my friend. Well, those who are faithful to God in this great time of testing still to come will be those who keep his commandments. Amen? Is there a tie-in between the Sabbath and God's law? Let's take a closer look. Where in God's law is he mentioned as creator? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We just read that. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. How much? In it thou shalt not do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right. God is mentioned as creator in 
the Sabbath commandment. Wow. Is the Sabbath the mark of God's authority? Let's take a look at the concept of a seal for a minute. A seal or mark of authority. A seal authenticates a legal document. As we see here, the seal of the President of the United States. Now there are several elements in a seal. We have the name of the sovereign or president, his title, and the territory he governs. So we say, therefore, George W. Bush, President, United States of America. And there we have the elements of the seal. Similarly, Elizabeth II, Queen, the title, the name of the title, and the territory, Canada, province of British Columbia. Well, that's pretty clear so far, isn't it? Now we have the legal document, the Ten Commandments. This is a document, because a seal is placed upon a legal document. Is God's seal found in his legal document, the Ten Commandments? Remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shalt thou labor, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, for in six days the Lord, the name of the sovereign, made, that's his title as creatorship, the territory he governs, the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Whoa, that's the seal, my friend, of the lawgiver, of the sovereign. God's seal is in the heart of God's law, the Sabbath. It contains his name, his title, and his territory. Clear as crystal, isn't it? The seal of God, the Sabbath, the Lord thy God, creator, or made, heaven and earth. There we go. The Bible says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a, what does it say? Sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. It says what? The Sabbath is a sign, a memorial, a beacon, a seal, my friend. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Isaiah 8, verse 16. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that wonderful Bible truth we've seen now. So the Sabbath is the mark or seal of God's authority. It pertains to his creatorship. It pertains to his commandments. Those who did not receive the mark of the beast are the ones who keep God's commandments. Enacting laws is an attribute of sovereignty. The sovereign enacts laws. The Ten Commandments are God's laws. The Sabbath is the seal of God's authority as sovereign. The fourth commandment pertains to God's creatorship. Remember the Sabbath day, four and six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So the mark or seal of God's authority as creator is his Sabbath. Amen and amen. Once again, my friend, are you keeping God's Sabbath now? And here's what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's not merely a legal requirement in the Ten Commandments. Why do we want to keep Christ's commandments? Because we love him. We love Jesus, so we want to Obey him. He's our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Do you love Jesus, my friend? Then won't you obey him? Won't you keep his commandments? Won't you start keeping his Sabbath? By God's grace. Even if everyone else says no, you don't need to do that. If the whole world says to you, no, you don't need to do that. If the minister says to you, no, you don't need to do that. Still, 
because we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. Amen? Is that your decision today by God's grace? So that's a decision in the forehead, a moral decision. God's seal and God's law in the forehead. Here's what the Bible says. This is exciting, my friends. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God says he'll put his laws where? In the mind and write them on our hearts, praise God. Oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? Once again, Revelation chapter 7. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Verses 2 and 3. So God's servants, his people, receive the seal of God on their foreheads. A symbolic seal, not a literal stamp, is a symbol of a conscious decision to obey God's commandments, to keep his Sabbath, the seal of his authority as creator, as sovereign, because we love him. Amen? In the forehead. A moral, conscious decision. Have you made that decision, my friend? God's people make a conscious decision to obey him because they love him. They are sealed in their foreheads. God's seal stands in contrast to the beast's mark. What is the beast? We've had that study. Remember the 15 points of identification? The Antichrist beast, first of all, is a kingdom that is a government in the world, made up of the kingdoms of Daniel chapter 7. It's also a religion. The woman sitting upon the beast Pagan Rome gave it the power and seat and great authority which it enjoyed for centuries. The seven heads point to the seven hills of Rome on which the woman sits symbolically. The ten horns arose out of pagan Rome, the barbarian tribes which conquered Rome and became the nations of Europe. It had power for 1260 years, power to persecute, worldwide power. It received a deadly wound in 1798 when Napoleon took away the territory and power of the papacy. The deadly wound has been healed. The papacy received back its territory much of its power and has gained in worldwide influence. And all the world is wondering, even today, at the remarkable recovery of the beast power. The head of it is a man. That's the Pope, my friend. His official name is Blasphemous. Remember what that name is? Vicarius Filii Dei, which means substitute son of God. That's the official title of the Pope, and that is blasphemous, my friend. The numerical value of his name is 666. We saw that in our study. The Antichrist beast is the Roman Catholic Church, specifically the papacy. What then is the mark of the beast's authority. What is the mark of authority of the Roman Catholic Church? If the Sabbath is the mark of God's authority, then the change of the Sabbath would be the mark of the beast's authority. Change of the Sabbath? We studied that quite a while back, if you recall. In other words, why is it that 
most christians worship on sunday as a day of worship because the catholic church changed the sabbath or claimed to at least you can't change what god has done but they okay are you ready for this one proof positive the smoking gun evidence right here what does it say sunday is our mark of authority what did it say sunday is our mark of authority the church is above the bible and this transference of sabbath observance is proof of that fact catholic record september 1 1923 can you believe what you just read what does the catholic church say sunday is our what does it say our mark of authority why because they claim the church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact, so they claim. Oh, that's a terrible statement. To me, that's a blasphemous statement to say that the church, any church, is above the Bible. That is absolutely outrageous, my friend. I'm sorry. I'm indignant. Sunday is our mark of authority. That tells me right there that Sunday is the mark of authority of the beast power. Here is a letter from a Catholic official. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. A mark of her power and authority. The mark of the beast is Sunday worship. Friend, the mark of the beast is Sunday worship. Next time you start to go into a Sunday keeping church and sit there on Sunday morning, remember that the mark of the beast is Sunday worship. You don't want to be a part of that, do you? Oh, by God's grace, no. It will be enforced by the second beast of Revelation 13. We'll study that next time, by the way. We'll study about that second beast of Revelation 13. You won't want to miss that study. Most of the world will receive the mark of the beast. Ooh, look at that picture. Yeah, it probably won't be something exactly like that, but the fact remains that most of the world will receive the mark of the beast. A barcode whatever form it takes, it's a symbolic mark. Most of the world will receive the mark. Friend, don't you receive it, okay? The Bible warns all the world wondered after the beast. Revelation 13, verse 3. All the world, almost everyone is deceived. Oh, brother, sister, let's you and I not be deceived. Amen. Let's stay faithful. Let's not receive the mark. Why does almost all the world receive the mark of the beast? What happened to all these wonderful people? Well, for one thing, it's deception. A great deception will take place. Revelation 13, verse 13. He performs great signs so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow. There will be miracles, my friend. You'll see wonderful miracles happen. And people will see that and say, well, this beast power must be from God. Here's the miracles, the evidence of our eyes. Fire come down from heaven. Do you recall when Elijah the prophet called Israel to make a decision between God and serving Baal back in the Old Testament? The evidence that God is God was that fire came down from heaven to authenticate, to vindicate God as a true God. In the last days, my friend, this apostate, deceitful power will be so convincing that the evidence will point to the belief that this must be from God. It's so authentic. 
But it's false, my friend. It's false. It's a lie. Deception. The books, the authors, the religious authorities, all saying, yeah, this is from God. You know something? All the world is going to tell you, this has got to be right. The Left Behind series pictured here, a novel of the Earth's last days. Deception, my friend. Oh, yes, the ministers, the evangelists, the seminarians all will say, yes, this is the power of God. This is clearly from God. Who are you to disagree with us? But friends, you and I need to stand not on some novel, not on some church leader, but on the holy word of God. Amen. Will you join me today, right now, in making a decision, a sacred decision, that I want to take my stand on God's holy word, the Bible, no matter what it costs by God's grace? And remember, there'll be pressure. We saw that earlier. That no one may buy or sell except he who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, verse 7. What does it say? He won't be able to buy or sell. You can't buy groceries in the store. How are you going to survive? Where will you get your food from? You can't buy gas down at the station. You can't buy or sell, my friend. How will we get around? But the Bible promises that their bread and water will be secure. God will not abandon his people in this time of crisis. Remember God sent the ravens to feed Elijah as he stayed faithful. God will provide a way for his faithful people to have food to eat, water to drink. They'll live, and God will be with them. But it gets worse. Oh, yeah, it gets worse. The Bible says as many as would not worship the image of the beast would be, what does it say? Killed. Oh, wow. There's going to be a death decree. Are you ready, my friend? They'll tighten the screws. They'll start by saying you can't buy or sell. And see if that persuades these people to comply. If that doesn't work, my friend, there will be a death decree. If you stay faithful to Jesus in that time of testing, a sentence for your death will go out. Are you ready to take a stand no matter what it costs, even at the cost of your life? Now, how close are we to the mark of the beast today? Is there a move today to enforce Sunday observance? Wow, look at this stuff. First of all, the previous pope who recently passed away, as you recall, issued a formal letter or decree entitled Dies Domini. The Lord's Day. Here's what the Pope called for. Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Who's he talking about? Christians. Well, Christians, those who believe in Jesus. Christians will do what? Strive to ensure that civil legislation, that's the laws of the land, respect their duty to keep Sunday holy. Wow, that's calling for the enforcement of Sunday holiness or Sunday observance. It's right there. The celebration of the Christian Sunday remained on the threshold of the third millennium an indispensable element of our Christian identity. Who said that? The Pope. Remember, Sunday is the mark of authority of the Pope of the beast power. Notice this response, the Detroit News, 1998. The Pope's call for worship welcomed. This is really an extraordinary move, said Jay McNally, executive director of Call to Holiness, 
a Metro Detroit lay group that promotes traditional Catholic teachings. This appears to be the strongest words the Pope has issued, period. Pope John Paul II is issuing a stern warning to Catholics that they should set aside Sunday for worship, not errands or their free time. In his letter, the Pope goes on to say a violator should be punished as a what? As a heretic. Wow. If you don't keep Sunday holy, you should be punished as a heretic. Persecuted. The Pope calling for that. Wow. Incredible. Will Protestant churches unite with this beast power? Notice this reference. The observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. So when the Protestants worship on Sunday, they are paying homage to the authority of the Catholic Church church. Plain talk about the Protestantism of today, page 213. Now, notice this news article about a recent church convention. Randolph Adler, Archbishop of the International Communion of the Charismatic Episcopal Church, recently shocked his audience by what he said. He preached a message about the failure of Protestantism and its forthcoming destruction. At about the same time, at an international conference of parish clergy in Atlanta, three speakers shared his assessment. Dr. Ben Johnson, a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary, said, we are seeing the ending of Protestantism as it is known and do not know what will follow. Wow, unbelievable. Dr. John Hall of the United Church of Canada said, we are witnessing the demise of Protestantism. Incredible statements, aren't they, my friend? How do you feel about that? Pastor Adler believes that the word of the Lord told us that what we are witnessing is the end of an era. We all sensed what God was saying to us. We were witnessing the end of Protestantism. God's church is Catholic, he declared. It was Catholic in the beginning. It will be Catholic in the end. Chattanooga Free Press, May 10, 1997. How do you feel about that, my friend? You see, the religious, the Christian world is going back to the Catholic fold. It'll be Catholic in the end. Oh, help. Because Catholicism, the papacy, is that apostate beast power. That means that Protestants and Catholics will unite to support and enforce the supremacy, the authority of the Catholic Church. And what's the mark of authority of the Catholic Church? We saw that from their own publication. What did they say? Sunday is our mark of authority. The Church is above the Bible, they say. It's happening. It's getting there. Oh, the warning. God gives a warning, my friend. Heed the warning. Don't put it off. Don't receive the mark. Make a decision today. Take your stand now. Oh, yeah. The mark is still in the future. No one has a mark of the beast today. But we're gearing up for it. The whole world is gearing up for it in order to take a stand in that final time of testing, my dear friend, we need to start taking a stand today. Don't put it off. Remember the tragic story of Noah and the ark? Noah preached for 120 years. People ridiculed him. The ark was sitting there. Finally, Noah said, made an appeal, come on in. Everybody mocked him. Well, the day came when the ring started coming down. Can you imagine those people now banging on the door of the ark? Noah, we were wrong. Let us in. But God's angel had slammed that door shut. It was too late. 
They waited too long. Friend, don't wait too long. Take your stand today by God's grace, will you? Amen. What is your decision? Sabbath or Sunday? Jesus Christ or Antichrist? The commandments of God or the commandments of man? You've got to make a decision, my friend. Sometimes decisions aren't easy. It means sacrifice. It means change. Sometimes people try to avoid making painful decisions, put them off, think that maybe somehow it'll go away. Do you know something about this decision? Not making a decision is making a decision. Because unless we take our stand for Jesus, we will end up going along with the beast's power to survive, to get groceries, to stay alive. Oh, what a tragedy that would be. What's your decision today? What's mine? Now here's the claim of power of the papacy. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Wow, what a claim of power. Oh, that's terrible. Here is something that's been offered in the past. I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the holy Catholic Church. What does it say? The entire world bows down in reverent obedience to the Catholic Church. God have mercy on us, my friend. We don't want to do that, do we? Do you want to do that? Do you want to bow down to some church? God forbid. I bow down, I worship only God. The authority for me, my friend, is God's holy word, the Bible, not some church edict. How about you? Jesus said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Will you keep his commandments because you love him? Will you start keeping his Sabbath holy, like Jesus said? But the Pope says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. Which decision will you make? Are you going to follow Jesus, or are you going to follow the Pope, my friend? If you follow Jesus then we should start keeping his Sabbath. Don't you think so? Don't keep Sunday. It's a mark of authority of the beast power. It's the proof, so they claim, that the church is above the Bible. Don't be a part of that apostate power, my friend. Which will you follow? What's your decision today? Today, my friend, make a decision. Don't put it off any longer. The coming crisis is similar to the days of Daniel. The Babylonian king, a powerful world leader, established a counterfeit image and compelled worship contrary to God's command. You remember the story? First of all, the king had this dream about the metal image with the gold and silver and bronze and iron and feet of iron and clay. Daniel, with God's direction, told him the meaning of the dream. God warned the king that his empire would not last forever, that another and another and another would follow after him. After a while, the king didn't want to hear that anymore. So he defied God and created a huge golden image and ordered everyone to bow down to that image. Daniel's three friends refused to do it. God delivered them. 
That's the story he's talking about here. Oh, yes. The three friends of Daniel kept standing. And the king said, you'll be thrown into that fiery furnace. It was heated seven times hotter. You imagine the king sitting back and saying, ha, woe to those who defy my authority. And then the king starts up from his chair there. He looks and says, didn't we throw three men into the fire? His servants say, yes, O king. And he says, look, they're walking around. There's a fourth one walking with him, like the son of God. My friend, Jesus didn't keep his faithful people from the fire, but he walked with them in that fire and rescued them in that fire. You see, there's going to be times of terrible trial ahead of us. The great test of the mark of the beast. God doesn't pluck us out of the world before that time. We have to pass through that test. But Jesus will walk with his faithful people in that time of testing. And Jesus will help you. He'll help me, my friend, if only we stay faithful to him. No matter what it costs, even if our lives are threatened, Jesus will be with you in that fiery furnace. Praise God for that. In the days of Daniel, God invited his people to take a stand. And they did. In the days of Noah, God invited his people to take a stand. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Noah's family, his sons and their wives? Everybody standing around laughing at them, ridiculing them. Look at our beautiful world. This has gone on for hundreds of years. You're crazy. You go on that silly ark. Ha! Well, you know what? They took a stand, didn't they? And God rescued them and delivered them. Amen. In the days of Jesus, God invited his people to take a stand. When Jesus was crucified, how popular was it to be faithful to Jesus? As he was dying on that cross, his own closest followers abandoned him. Oh, friends. God invites his people to take a stand for the right, for Jesus. Will you? In the days of early Christianity, God invited his people to take a stand. It wasn't easy back then, friends. Can you picture yourself there in the Colosseum, in the arena, standing there, sitting there? There's the lions. They're coming to eat you, to devour you. It wasn't easy to take a stand then, was it? But they did. They have a wonderful reward waiting for them in heaven, don't they? Praise God. In the dark ages, God invited his people to take a stand. Oh, that terrible apostate beast power had worldwide power and military force to back it up. And they said, either you do it our way or you're put to death. You lose your homes. You flee. But God's faithful people fled to the mountains and stayed faithful to him during those centuries. In the dark ages, God invited his people to take a stand, and they did. In the last days, God invites his people to take a stand. Oh, friend, he invites you to take a stand today. Will you, my friend? Will you? Jesus is the good shepherd. He leads his people. Will you follow where he leads? Jesus calls us to follow him and keep his Sabbath. That's where he's leading now. Prepare to stand in the time of the mark of the beast. Start now. Will you follow Jesus today? Start keeping his Sabbath today by God's grace. Notice this statement by a Catholic priest. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did, happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. 
St. Catherine Catholic Church, Sentinel, May 21, 1995. That's an admission. That's incredible evidence. The church itself says that people who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and do what? Keep Saturday holy. My friend, do you believe that the scriptures should be the sole authority? Amen? Do we say amen to that? Then will you start keeping Saturday holy? Because the Bible says, because Jesus says, because we love Jesus. Is that your decision today by God's grace? Here's what lies ahead for God's faithful, tested, persecuted people. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. Revelation 15, verse 2. Oh, friend, don't you want to stand on that sea of glass? Don't you want to have the victory over the beast, his image, his mark, his number? Don't you want to be there and have the heart of God and rejoice with Jesus? Won't you say then, it was worth it all? Oh, by God's grace, make that sacred decision today, won't you? Won't you respond to Jesus leading right now? Will you follow Jesus today? Again, don't put it off, my friend. Will you begin keeping his Sabbath? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this has been an incredible study. This has been an eye-opener. And Lord, we see your calling. We see what you call us to do. And Lord, we want to be faithful. We don't want to receive the mark of the beast in that day of testing. We want to go to heaven and stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God to rejoice there with Jesus throughout eternity. But Lord, we see that we've got to get ready. We've got to prepare. We need to make our decision to take our stand now. Help us, Lord, to take that stand. Help us to be faithful to Jesus. Help us, Lord, to start keeping your Sabbath, the mark of your authority. Help us to turn away from it, to renounce the mark of the beast authority, Sunday worship, and follow Jesus all the way. Lord, it may not be easy for some of us to do that. It may mean a change. It may mean an adjustment. It may mean sacrifice. But Lord, we think about what Jesus did on Calvary. He died on the cross. We think of Jesus in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, a terrible test of his faith, but he hung in there. He was faithful because he loved you and loved me, my friend. We think of Jesus there on trial, scourged, ridiculed, mocked, sent us to a terrible death. We think of Jesus carrying that heavy cross to the place of his death. We think of Jesus stretched out upon that cross, his hands and feet nailed to that cross. He stayed faithful. He gave his all. He gave his life for you and me then can't we do this little thing for Jesus? It's not a big thing that you ask of us right now. Just to start keeping your Sabbath. Can't we say, yes, Lord Jesus, you've done so much for me. I want to do this in appreciation and love for you, Lord Jesus. I want to start keeping your Sabbath. I put it off any longer. My friend, is that your decision today? If so, I invite you as our heads are bowed, as our eyes are closed, to raise your hand in the sight of God. Raise your hand, my friend, right where you are, and say, yes, Lord Jesus, by your grace, I make that decision. I want to be faithful to Jesus no matter what it costs. Yes, I'll take a stand now. I want to start keeping your Sabbath by your grace. God sees the hands, and there's rejoicing in heaven. Praise God.